Hello and welcome to the Australian Bitcoin Podcast. It's your host, Daniel Wilczynski. On today's show, we have Jeremy Majid, the former product manager at Hadblock, who is now the CEO of Australian Bitcoin industry body. So we will find out who is Jeremy and learn about what is the Australian Bitcoin industry body. Let's get on to the show. Hi, Jeremy. Welcome back. I can't say welcome because you've, you've been on the show, obviously hosting it before, but uh, welcome back. Maybe we'll just start off with you giving a quick intro and background about yourself. Sure. Thanks, Daniel. And yeah, it is good, good to be back. I guess I studied mechanical engineering and kind of went through the corporate career type thing for a bit over 10 years, um, mostly in supply chain planning, um, a little bit of automotive and a few different industries and it's interesting through this podcast talking to people i found um they had a very similar theme and that they just didn't feel like they fit into that corporate environment and i always felt that way well for as i got more senior into my roles and it became more political i felt that way because you found that appearing to do work was more important than actually doing work which is what you find in those sort of fiat type organizations and as it happened, just for family reasons, I chose to become a, a stay-at-home dad and took on part-time jobs. So I took on jobs that suited my schedule rather than what I wanted to do. I ended up going to a Bitcoin meetup in Adelaide a few years ago now and met you and that's how I ended up joining Hardblock. It, it feels like a long time ago for me now doing those sort of roles where I, I had to kind of bite my tongue and not say what I really felt. And it just, you know, I, I, speak, I see people, even yesterday, I was speaking to someone yesterday who was having to go through those sort of meetings where you just have to listen and pretend like you agree. And it just, it sucks energy from your soul. And I'm very glad that that sort of part of my career is behind me now. And I can work on things where, yeah, you can just say what you, what you believe. Uh, I think that's a very important thing to be able to do. I think that's one of the things that draws people to working with Bitcoin and why I wanted to work in Bitcoin, probably why you and a lot of people is because it's not just kind of a job, it's. It is actually something we believe in and we yes. passionate in and we spend our spare time in it. And in a lot of corporate jobs like they say, you know, you have to become passionate about your company or whatever, and people pretend like they are. Yes. But it's mostly pretending. And I think in Bitcoin, actually, people generally are passionate about what they're doing. Absolutely. And you can tell the difference because so much more gets done in small Bitcoin and open source organizations. So much more gets done because people actually want to do the work as opposed to the fiat organizations where people are trying to just kind of fill the time. And so you say you worked in some corporate environments. Yep. You mind saying a bit more? Like I studied mechanical engineering. I mostly worked in supply chain planning, which is kind of when you're in a large complex organization, making sure you have all of the raw materials in the right place at the right time, you know, whether it's a big factory or a logistics network, there's a lot of complex parts to it. You've got to make sure that you're optimizing the manufacturing plants that could be worth $20 million or something, uh, making sure that you're getting the flow through those so you get the return on capital and also optimizing your logistics costs and providing customer service. So there's a whole lot of complexity that comes from managing that and then doing it on budget and explaining it to senior management. So I essentially did that for quite a bit of my career and then I got a little bit bored of that. So I tried to go into more strategic slash innovation roles. And that's where I found that I, they became much more political and people were sort of saying that they were going to deliver this thing in three years. And it was really obvious it wasn't possible. Um, and that's when I started kind of moving around. And, and as it happened, we moved to Adelaide just after that. So I was able to leave uh, one of those jobs. But I basically saw, saw that same sort of trend. I went into another company in Adelaide working in a wine industry, similar type of <clears throat> logistics um, optimization role. Uh, and there you've got, you know, like huge tanks full of wine that cost a lot of money. And if you have too much stock left over, you have to throw it out and, and, and um, <clears throat> it's terrible for the bottom line. So mostly those kind of logistics, supply chain planning roles uh, and then communicating that, turning those that insight and communicating it to senior management in simple terms about, you know, what does that mean for profit and loss and what do we have to, what are the risks and those sorts of things. Okay. And so how was it that you came, got interested in Bitcoin? You know, I said I didn't, gel in a lot of those roles. And I was looking for a way to earn money without having to be in one of those corporate type roles. And I, I, for some reason, I don't know how I came across it, but at the time people were doing Forex trading and said, oh, I'm going to learn how to do this Forex trading and then I'm going to make an income from that. And I didn't make an income from that. And it was, I don't recommend anyone does it, but because I was reading books about it, 
I got uh, my, my Amazon algorithm was suggesting books about currency. And so I started reading about like the history of money and learning about fiat currency. And this is quite a while ago. And I got quite heavily into gold um, back then um, because, you know, logically, once you learn about fiat currencies, you're like, oh, my God, I don't want my savings in this. And then I sort of didn't touch it for a while. And from there, I started learning about Bitcoin actually through um, Real Vision. I was following them. And prior to them getting into crypto, some of their content was actually very good. And I'd sort of seen Raul Powell, he was very into gold and then he started um, adding a lot of Bitcoin to his portfolio. I thought this is interesting and I got a little bit into it and then just started, you know, podcast and reading. And the thing that really made it click for me was the the Bitcoin standard. I can literally remember where I was and when it, I'm like, oh shit, this is the thing that's going to like change everything. And, and it was because he explained that when in the, because I think in the gold, um, sort of gold bulk space, people think that we're going to go back to a gold standard. And I thought that for a while, I thought that was the logical conclusion as we exit fair currencies, we'll go to a gold standard, but safety made the really good point that, you know, the history of money is actually related to technology. So when we went from a gold and silver standard to a gold standard, that wasn't to do with gold. That was to do with the railway and the telegram and being able to communicate across distances much faster. Well, it just, it just became really obvious to me that once we have the internet, and this open source software protocol, Bitcoin, that is the new technology that's going to allow us to transition to this new money. Um, we're not going to go back to a gold standard where you'd have to like ship the gold to other countries. Like it just, there's no way that's going to happen when you've got Bitcoin that can do it so much better. So yeah, that's kind of a long winded way of saying that because I was already into, I knew about fair currencies and I knew about gold, the transition to Bitcoin wasn't um, such a leap, but it did still take me a while to, to, I guess, gain confidence that it was going to be the, the money. Like it, it took me a while. Um, and I think the other thing that was really influential was uh, Michael Saylor's interview when he very first started purchasing Bitcoin, uh, which was also on Real Vision. It was like a two hour interview. It was excellent. But it was around interview. like 2018, right? Uh, no, I think like 2020, like late 2020, like after COVID. And he was, it was, I think it was almost the first interview he did about Bitcoin. Um, it was two hours and it's just like an unbelievable interview. And he explained it so well that, you know, if you bought all the gold in the world in 1900, by the end of, by the year 2000, you don't have a third of the gold in the world because the continual inflation over a century just keeps deteriorating. And that's the value of the fixed supply in Bitcoin. Around 2020, 21, we met, we met at the Adelaide Bitcoin coin meetup yep. and at that point, I think you just kind of finished your previous roles in the kind of corporate environment you were kind of recently out of there and we decided to work together and you helped me as the product manager at Hardblock. So maybe just briefly, like, how did you find that experience? I think we worked for a year and a half. I probably didn't mention there was <clears throat> probably for the last decade or so, um, I had also on my own time and with my wife to publish some books. And to do that, we had to, I had to learn everything about how, like how to lay out a book and do a book cover and website. So I taught myself design skills, basically just from YouTube and trying to figure stuff out. And so those skills, um, along with work I'd been doing in previous roles, um, on some IT projects, uh, were quite a good fit for that product design role. Yeah. I really enjoyed having that opportunity to work a with Bitcoin and B in a way to bring new Bitcoiners into it. Um, to try and simplify and explain it. So people who maybe are coming in as an investment, just an honor buy some Bitcoin thinking it's like shares, trying to create a product for them where they can go on that path to, you know, it's investment to you trying to self custody their money and trying to make that easy and, and clear. And two of the things I'll back up, I'm, I'm really proud of. I think the DCA product that we built at Hardblock is still the best that I've experienced. And I still use it. I think it's great, especially for, you know, trying to save your kids, it makes it super easy. And just the, the design of the, of the site, I still use it all the time just to check the price, go on my phone. When I look at those two pieces of work that I did, um, I just think we achieved a lot in, with not many resources. And I just like so much more than I achieved when I was working in fiat organizations. I would go literally like a year or two in an IT project and achieve nothing. Just go to a lot of meetings and do legal terms and conditions and trying to get funding. And we would literally achieve nothing. And, in two years and at Hardblock, we achieved so much with so little and that's because you know we all have an aligned purpose and you know we all had the same goal yeah so i think those those are the two things i look back on i think that, that was really really cool to be able to have done those and that those are still 
still being used today? Okay, yeah, so we parted wise at the end of 2022. And that was, correct me if I'm wrong, but that was you wanted to focus, help your wife with her. She was starting a new business. So you wanted to primarily spend more time with that. But you also took on a new role as CEO of the Australian Bitcoin industry body. And you're obviously still in that role. <laughs> so what might you want to get involved with the Australian Bitcoin industry body? I guess for me, I think we always, all of us want to contribute to Bitcoin in a way, utilizes our skills. And I, my previous role to Hardblock, I was working at effectively an industry body in infrastructure. It was my first time doing that, but I'd seen what the industry body is meant to do, how they operated. I also have, I guess, developed some pretty good political and communication skills through my corporate career. And so when I heard that there was an industry body being developed for the Bitcoin industry, I felt, well, that's like a really good way that I can contribute back to Bitcoin. I'm not a software developer, so I can't just go into GitHub and write code. That would be a cool thing to be able to do, but I, I can't do that. But I can interpret the complexity of Bitcoin in language that people in the government, for example, can understand. So I thought that was a really good fear. And it's, there's just not many people like that in the Bitcoin space. Most people that I've met so far are programmers, or they're, they're like in economics, but there's just, there's very few people who come from a communication or kind of corporate background that I've met, although that's changing. I've noticed that changing a bit this year, but, um, so I felt like it was almost, um, not a duty, but I felt like I have the skills to do it and it needs to be done. So I put my hand up. I mean, just for some context that people don't know what Australian Bitcoin industry body or ABIB is prior to the formation of ABIB, which Ethan of, um, Bitteroo, um, led. Um, basically, the only industry body representing Bitcoin or even crypto was Blockchain Australia. And Blockchain Australia have, I guess you could say, questionable ethics um, and don't separate Bitcoin from crypto. So that was obviously not an option for the Bitcoin industry, Bitcoin only industry, such as Hardblock, but also like Wallet of Satoshi and the other Bitcoin only exchanges like Bitteru to be represented by Blockchain Australia because their goals are just very different. I mean, they almost welcome regulation. They, they kind of have a legal background well, and no so i'm just saying not always do they do and a lot of these companies were trying to get more regulation to build a moat around themselves yes that too but also they they, they have a legal background yeah. so regulation is great for lawyers because the more time yeah, spend writing... yeah there's lawyers there's lawyers there's, yeah there's, that's correct there's lawyers involved in the blockchain australia so and they make money helping organizations deal with that regulation that they help create. But there's a few other things. Uh, sorry for interrupting, but I just want to give okay. some background yeah, sure, on sure. Blockchain Australia, like why I, where I'm kind of, I never personally joined it with hard block. And again, I, it's not that they're all bad, but first thing, there were a few people who were outright scammers in it. Uh, there yes. were, I can't, I forget, there was an exchange that with the owner ran away with the funds. Oh. I can't remember his name. The person I was referring to here was Sam Lee from Blockchain Global. Now back to the show. Yeah, but he was part of the prominent in Blockchain of Australia. Was, not everybody there is a scammer, but there were a few people who were just outright scammers who were involved in it. But also just the, the way running some of the conferences they put on, the terminology they used, they were almost like they were running away from Bitcoin. Like yes. for them, Bitcoin was this kind of like a bad smell, this kind of like cypherpunk, freedom money. And it's like, oh, okay, we're running. We're trying to distance themselves from Bitcoin and talk about blockchain technology. But for me, I'm not trying to distance. I want to promote Bitcoin. Absolutely. I want to be part. And I, I don't even mind that they're involved with some other cryptocurrency, but I want to be part of an organization that promotes Bitcoin, not tries to dense distance itself from Bitcoin. That's why I personally never joined. But yeah, sorry for that kind of interruption. There's other, there's other examples. Like Alex Saunders, I think, was on the board of Blockchain Australia. He was a pump and dump scammer. So Ethan discovered that Austrax, which regulates all of the blockchain, uh, Bitcoin exchanges in Australia, we're meeting with blockchain Australia and he wanted to meet with them. They said, no, you've got to have an industry body. We can't meet with every exchange, which is sort of fair enough. Cause there's like 400 or so registered digital exchanges in Australia. 
So this industry body was formed for the purpose initially of being able to liaise with Austrac directly, which has been really, really positive. Um, we had our meeting with them in March and they were really engaged. They had sent a lot of people and, you know, I feel like there's a very strong relationship there. And from there, we've been doing things like following the regulation. So when new regula regulation is proposed, the government will put out a consultation paper and they'll have questions in it and the industry can respond. So we've responded to all of those that are related to crypto and a couple of others that we've been invited to, like a digital records one for New South Wales government. And there's a, there's a couple of new ones coming out. I got a letter recently about the attorney general's reviewing the money laundering and terrorism financing regulations within Australia. So that's kind of a, a key thing we're doing. But what I'm starting to see is that more mainstream kind of businesses are starting to get Bitcoin and I'm starting to meet people from those businesses. So I guess we, we started out representing purely Bitcoin exchanges and also Wallet of Satoshi, which is a wallet, but also kind of an exchange as well. But now we're starting to see businesses just like accountants, tax lawyers, um, SEO, financial planning, um, inheritance planning, these types of businesses, which are not pure Bitcoin businesses, they're kind of traditional Bitcoin, uh, traditional businesses that are starting to adopt Bitcoin. And I think that's really exciting because that's the start of the mainstream adoption. And what I'd like to see us do is to start to be a way that we can kind of be a, a point of um, communication for those businesses. So just help them to network and introduce to each other because they're going to have challenges implementing Bitcoin into their business. Like you can imagine if you're an accounting firm and you've always just dealt with Australian dollars and bank payments, you know, starting to have Bitcoin in your balance sheet, how do you do the custody of that if you're in your business? Um, there's some there's some genuine challenges there. And so for people who are new to be able to, to touch base with other new, uh, I guess, businesses in, a, in that similar kind of adjacent kind of businesses, I think is going to be very powerful. Um, a lot of these businesses, well, they, they're used to kind of using Gmail and Microsoft and all these and Facebook. And they don't realize that a lot of the discussion is happening in Telegram and Signal and all these other places. So they don't really know how to navigate this new the Bitcoin world. It's all new to them. So again, we can kind of introduce them to that and be like a liaison from these people coming from the mainstream into the, the Bitcoin world, if you will. But what's the manifesto of IBIB? Uh, our first and key point is Bitcoin, not crypto. Okay. So that's, that's really what we are trying to communicate. A lot of the regulations are just crypto regulations. And most people in government, it's really weird the way they do their analysis. They do like a scientific literature review. So they go and read all the papers that have been produced, like the BIS will create a paper about crypto, which is a really, I think, uh, not effective way to analyze Bitcoin. Because what you could do is just download the Bitcoin software and work out what it's doing. Like you, the evidence, you can get the first hand evidence and see how it works. Or you can read Mastering Bitcoin, but they never reference like Mastering Bitcoin or anything or the Bitcoin standard in their in their papers. We, we try to make the point that Bitcoin is different to crypto. And just an example of, uh, how different it is, all of the members of ABIB, so all of the exchanges, none of them have ever gone bankrupt. None of them have ever rug pulled anyone. Um, none of them have ever run away with uh, funds. They're all still here. That's not the case in the crypto space. And what the crypto regulation is trying to do is protect Australian citizens from scams, a, a lot of the case. But the thing is, that's never happened in, 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 to any of uh, members of ABIB. So there's a lot of regulation which is really not necessary to have in the Bitcoin space because, you know, you're not going to have, there's no altcoins, so you can't add rug pulls. There's no, all of the exchanges are fully backed. So you're not going to have that situation like FTX where the money's all gone. Our exchanges all encourage self-custody, which is the safest way for people to secure their money. So that, that key point is around Bitcoin and not crypto. We also want to see the government hold Bitcoin. And uh, there's a few reasons for that. We actually, I'm going to, I'm writing the process of writing a petition to get, to ask the RBA to hold Bitcoin. The interesting, the Bank of International Settlements um, actually allows banks to hold up to 2% of their capital in, in Bitcoin. And I think it's actually very important for us as a country to do so, because if you look at our foreign reserves, I was just looking at it yesterday. I think we have about 85 billion in foreign reserves or something like that. 88% of our foreign reserves are in fiat currencies and about 8% is in gold. And that gold is in the UK the Bank of England, it's not in Australia. So we have no real money in Australia in our foreign reserves. And then we have all of the Australian dollars, but you know, we can print those. So they're not accepted as a, I guess, as a, a money that's as strong as say gold. So we have no hard money in Australia. So I'd like to see us have 2% of 
of our foreign reserves in Bitcoin as just as an insurance policy <laughs> when the other currencies collapse and if the gold is not able to be accessed from the Bank of England. The third one is around privacy and freedom of speech. A lot of the, the regulations and when you, de- when you deal with people in government, they're actually, I'd say 99% of the people in government are well-meaning and good, hardworking people. There's just a very small minority that are trying to achieve a different agenda, I suppose. And those people, they kind of get blinded by the fact that, oh, we need to, we need to get everyone's data so that we can protect from terrorism financing or something. And they forget that privacy is a human right. Um, we don't have to treat everyone like criminals just because maybe 0.1% of people are criminals. And so we just want to remind people that privacy and freedom of speech are very important in our society. And the final one, we, we do want to also encourage um, financial education, uh, which is, I guess, a tricky goal. But yeah, and I think really Bitcoin, not crypto is is where we want to focus. Finally, just you know, encouraging financial self-sovereignty, which all of our all of our members do. Um, self-custody in Bitcoin, because when you do that, you take away the power of the banks to inflate away our money. So that's uh, Bitcoin, not crypto, getting the Australian government to hold Bitcoin on its balance sheet. That would be, that's pretty ambitious, but it's great. Yep. Hopefully you got to start somewhere. <laughs> it's got to be ambitious. Yeah. Yep. And the third one is uh, encouraging self-sovereignty. Is yeah. Privacy, freedom of speech. And then the final was financial oh, self-sovereignty. Okay. Yep. So is there any kind of things, any achievements? <clears throat> You've been for oh, six months, so that's too not that long, but any kind of achievements you're proud of in those six months? I think the main role that we have is communicating in, we're almost translating from the Bitcoin world to the government sort of world uh, in both directions. So we've put forward our views in, in papers, uh, submissions around what one of the documents was called caspers i can't remember what it stands for basically it's about how to regulate crypto exchanges and businesses including for example where they custody their their bitcoin like as you know a lot of exchanges in australia they look like an exchange but actually it's just a front end and the back end is binance which means the bitcoin or whatever altcoins are not even custody in australia so that makes it very hard if like ftx for example if ftx collapses and the and the Bitcoin was custodied in Bahamas or something. So that we put forward our opinion on that. A lot of these uh, regulations, I don't think, like some of them they do understand, but some of them they don't fully understand the implications of how Bitcoin works and the fact that the legal system can't just, for example, freeze someone's account. And then also translating the other way. So the recently, sort of late last year, the government put out a CBDC pilot document. And I was able to kind of read through that and put out a tweet thread on which I attended to a presentation as well on just what is it that these guys are doing with their CBDC pilot and what are the potential implications. I don't think it's as scary as a lot of people think, mainly because I don't think they're going to be able to build it. You know, government projects take a long, long time. uh, And the currency that is going to be the CBDC is the same as the current Australian dollar we have, which is going to inflate away. It's still a fair currency. They haven't got some magic money or we, we know they have very little gold to back it with. So our main focus is being a translator in both ways. And then I kind of see it like we're in a way playing kind of share options. Like we're just trying to see who is it that we can communicate with and and find networks with that we can influence. It's quite a hard goal. We're trying to take this basically anti-establishment message to the establishment. You know, it's like going into a church and saying, God doesn't exist. It's, it's a very hard, it's a very hard thing to do, but if you can start to influence a few people, I think it, it can be quite powerful. And, and as I said, the thing I'm excited about is seeing, starting to see what I'd consider, say, mainstream traditional corporate types starting to come to the Bitcoin bush bash, for example, and being able to, being able to help those people get together and, and communicate, I think is a, a very powerful thing we'll be able to do as well. What do you view the future of the Bitcoin industry, especially kind of in terms of regulation? What do you think is, have any changes? You might be submission to about that CIA, CASRP. The Caspers, yep. But, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce Caspers paper. But yeah, what do you see the future of like regulation and Bitcoin in Australia? So the latest paper, which was quite interesting, is about token mapping. So that was the one after Caspers. And so what they they were kind of faced with two options. Do they develop a whole set of regulations to manage crypto? Or do they try and map the crypto tokens to the existing regulations, kind of like how you would map a database. 
um, you know, like this stable coin fits into these, you know, regulations and Bitcoin fits into that regulation. And that's the way they've gone is the token mapping option. So we put forward, I put forward our views into that paper. I was, I mainly focused on trying to explain the difference between Bitcoin and crypto. It was a very weird paper in that it, it felt rushed to me. Like there were errors, like proofreading type errors, which is kind of odd in a paper like that. And then they gave us a month to respond. They also used definitions, which kind of didn't really work. Like I think if you were challenged them in court, you could say, well, this doesn't really apply to Bitcoin. So that was quite an interesting paper because for example, it, it excluded Bitcoin smart contracts from the paper. So it said those were not in scope. So I'm kind of hoping that we can make the argument that Bitcoin is actually different from crypto. Maybe we'll be regulated, for example, as a commodity, because that's uh, the, in the US, they've been quite explicit about that, that Bitcoin is a commodity and the rest are not. The rest are like basically financial products or securities, they call them over there. And I think that's a very powerful argument because trying to have regulations that follow the US, I think, you know, there's a chance of doing that. So what is the future for regulation in Bitcoin? I, I kind of think, and this is um, some advice from one of our sponsors who's a tax lawyer, the government is regulating the past. So they're going and regulating what happened two years ago. And then they spent, you know, two years doing that and doing consultation. And I think they're going to be perpetually behind. And I, I kind of think by the time they get around to actually agreeing on regulations for crypto, a lot of the industry will have collapsed. And then I, I don't even know if they're aware of lightning, for example, I kind of think they'll get to a point and they'll probably implement the, uh, some regulations and they'll almost be moot because parts of the, uh, industry they're trying to regulate uh, may have collapsed. For example, you know, stable coins, you look at USDC, with the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank, they almost went went under. They're not delivering on the promise of what the stable coin is meant to be in that example. So <clears throat> I guess, you know, it, it's hard to see exactly where it's going to go, but I, I don't think they will be able to keep up with the pace of, of how fast Bitcoin is innovating. And I don't think we should be too concerned at the moment. In terms of that coin mapping, so how, how do they view Bitcoin in that coin mapping paper? What's their take on it? They see it as kind of like the original money token, I suppose. I was pretty explicit in trying to say, well, the way they define it was not how it is defined. And I guess my, my view is that basically all, all of crypto are pyramid schemes for, for the basic reason that the point of, of Bitcoin to have the blockchain is to be decentralized and all of the all of the old coins have reinserted the central party into a blockchain, which is completely pointless because you may as well just have a fully centralized system. And I'm not against centralized systems. I think they have uh, advantages, but they're certainly faster and more efficient. But in the case of money, you don't want it to be centralized. So I said it, it actually legitimizes the whole crypto industry, which is dishonest. And so I think they shouldn't like almost regulating it is is bad because you're kind of acknowledging that this thing that's dishonest is uh, you like legitimizing it. So they, they kind of said there's not actually so much focus on Bitcoin in that paper. It's mostly on all the different, like literally they go into DeFi and NFTs and all that stuff. Very little of the paper really is about Bitcoin. There's a bit at the start and there are some genuine references that show that they actually get how Bitcoin works in it to some degree, but a lot of it is actually focused on um, crypto. And I think a lot of the crypto regulations that are coming don't actually, in fact, impact the Bitcoin industry. Um, they did, uh, for example, the new ones for AML that they're proposing only the changes really only affect like crypto to crypto exchanges and things that affect altcoins. And, you know, that, I think they've been distracted in, in a way, maybe it's positive. They've been distracted by DeFi and NFTs and kind of focusing in on that. And I think by, I'm hoping that by the time they actually get around to formalizing that, that legislation, those industries will have collapsed, but we'll, we'll see how that goes. One of the things I would like to get out there is some positive media articles. I think it's a role that an industry body should play. Uh, it's very difficult because the media have kind of like a, a clear agenda around and they're very largely very left wing leaning. So it, I guess it's a longer term goal for, for me is to, yeah, start to get some pods because there's some really great positive stories. Like for example, there was a, I think it's a national park in Congo or somewhere like that, where they were using hydropower to mine Bitcoin and the revenue stopped the, the national park from going bankrupt. You know, for example, like how can you, how can you can be against that? Similarly, the people in El Salvador who, you know, the president gives the example, they were getting a $70 US remittance 
And because of the fee savings from going to Western Union to Lightning, now they're getting $100 in those remittances. If you're on $70 a, a month or a week and you go to 100 that is absolutely massive for your family. Those are just really positive stories that are not getting out there. So I'd, I'd love to be able to um, find an avenue to get those stories to people who are not already in the Bitcoin community. It's quite easy for us to communicate with the Bitcoin community, but the, you know that's preaching to the converted. This is my CEO of Bitcoin. No. We're all part of Bitcoin. We're all yeah. the Bitcoin nodes and everything, all the marketing, all, all that it's up to us. Yes. And it's great. And the IB, I think it's part of that process, helping to coordinate everybody. So if there's anybody who can help, who has some knowledge with media, contact Jeremy and to try and get that kind of positive Bitcoin message out there. And also, yeah, works. If you can sponsor the Australian Bitcoin industry body, you'll be involved in that kind of communication that we do. I think of it kind of as, as like a war room where we have these Telegram groups and we can discuss our sponsors and how to promote Bitcoin. Absolutely. And also look out for the petition, which is coming probably around May, I'm thinking May or June. So if you do see the petition, if you could sign it and share it around, that would be a very, um, so the petition will be about uh, host, the Australian government holding Bitcoin in the balance sheet, essentially. So yeah, look out for that as well. And your Twitter? Um, to... So it's AusBTC Int Body. So at so AUSBTC IND Body. Yes, yeah, so you can find us there. We do we do post a bit. And sometimes if we do put out content like the CBDC tweet threads, that's a good place to, to kind of stay up to date with what's happening. And yeah, you can contact us there for a direct message if that's your preference um, or otherwise by uh, emailing us on the contact page of the website. Last kind of last question. Uh, apart from uh, like investing in Bitcoin, you also you still invest in the share market and you had uh, and your knowledge base is pretty good. Uh, and you actually gave some good tips when we were working together. You gave me some yep. good stuff tips. Well, what's your like, what are, what are some things you're looking at now? Uh, what you're investing in now apart from Bitcoin? Yes, I think I kind of, I read Nassim Taleb's books a long time ago, like before I, you know, like the, we used to go to a bookshop and buy them like it's that long ago. And I really resonate with his portfolio strategy, which is you keep 85 or even 90% very safe to me is Bitcoin and, you know, some gold and silver potentially uh, for some people, but, you know, in your own custody. So you're taking no risk. And then the remaining 10 to 15%, you're giving up custody of that to someone else. So you almost have to be prepared to lose it all. And if you're going to lose it all, then you want a really high potential return on that money. Um, so to me that, you know, you go very high risk. So I've been looking at um, commodities for the last few years. There are quite a few small Australian uh, companies on the stock exchange because uh, we are a mining nation. There's plenty of commodity companies on there. So it, it's, I think there's potential, and this is obviously not financial advice, uh, but there's potential for particularly silver mining in Australia and natural gas. The natural gas is a little bit harder because there's a mindset that has to change around that. You know, people think it's bad, but it's really not. And in fact, you need natural gas to make fertilizer to eat food. So, you know, if we think we're going to get away from natural gas, we're kidding ourselves, um, but we still need the mindset to change around that. And that could take, could take five years. It could take six months. I don't know, but there's some potentially high risk reward or high reward to risk opportunities in the natural gas sector, I think in Australia, uh, and also the silver miners. Cause I think when we start to get some pretty serious inflation, and I was just reading yesterday, grocery inflation in the UK is like 17%, which is insane. It won't take long for people to go, Oh, what, why is this inflation still here? What is going on with my money? Why can't I afford it? Everything. And then they'll start to get into Bitcoin or silver or gold or whatever. So I think potentially silver mines. I also think uranium has a good long-term potential. So there are a few uranium miners uh, for nuclear power plants on the Australian stock exchange. But again, that's probably a longer term thing. Like it might take a few years for those to, to, to pay off. But I guess my advice is if you, if you do, if you want to get into those sorts of areas, you've got to put the time. It's kind of like with Bitcoin. You've got to put the time in and do the research. You can't just pick a few stocks. I mean, you could get lucky, but you probably won't. But I also think if you're not willing to put in the time, just holding Bitcoin and maybe some gold and silver is a very amazing risk reward, uh, which we'll never get in our lives again. You know, to be able to hold money basically in your own custody and also have it go up in purchasing power is the way it's going to is it's never going to happen again in our lives. So you don't really need to, but I kind of do it more because I enjoy it. 
um, as well. So, and I, I do recommend people look into self-managed super because that's where most people have their, the most savings to be able to invest. I think I know a few people I've done it myself so that we can have Bitcoin in our super. That that's a really key thing. I think a lot of people could probably uh, look into as well. It was great to have you on Jeremy. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Daniel. Mm -hmm. Thanks yeah, for the opportunity to talk to people about ABIB and uh, hopefully we've resonated with a few people and I'd love to hear from them. Yeah, I think the organization is great. There's great people involved in it and I think it's doing good work. And I'm, I'm happy. I think you're doing a good job leading as the CEO and I'm happy to be a part of it and contribute how I can. I hope you enjoyed that show and learned something from it. If you did, give us a review on your favorite podcast player and see you next time. Keep stacking.